Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graeme Hill. Grace G. Sum Kim is a prolific writer, having published more than 10 books and 70 book chapters and journal articles. She challenges the church to engage with issues to do with Asian American Christian experience and the faith stories of Asian American women. Her work on the social and religious experience of Korean women immigrants to North American culture has received wide acclaim. Grace Ji Sung Kim unpacks theological and cultural riches to be found in Asian American and Asian American feminist approaches to faith and theology. She shows how Asian notions of wisdom and the spirit can communicate with Christian ideas today, and she challenges the North American church to move beyond patriarchal and colonial and repressive forms of faith and theology. Welcome to the Global Church Project. You've said that traditional Euro-Western theologies fail to nourish the soul of those who don't have a Western background or who are immigrants into Western countries. What do you mean by that? Well, anyway, let me say thank you for inviting me. I appreciate being um, invited into this project. So I think uh, for so long, for over 2,000 years, uh, theology has been Euros. Eurocentric and because it's Eurocentric it's not listening to the voices from the other parts of the world so the global south from Asia South America Africa and I think it's way overdue that we listen to those voices I think theology should not be so narrow in perspective it, uh, it has been so patriarchal in the past so I think we need to hear women's voices and once we allow the different voices to come in it, it really enriches the theology so I think it's important that we kind of have this global perspective have women's voices and people from all over the world um, join in so that we can understand God you know God is this infinite being and as finite beings we can't say we understand God fully. So we try mm. to hear as many voices and many perspectives mm. as possible to help us kind of understand mm. um, God yeah. better. Where do you see some creative examples of people exploring theology which is alternate to uh, the typical Euro-Western theological stream? Well, I think um, for our women around the world. So feminist mm -hmm. theologians, we're mm -hmm. really focusing a lot on women's experiences. Mm -hmm. And we know women's experiences are mm -hmm. quite different from men's mm -hmm. experience. So I think those are helping us understand mm -hmm. um, theology better. Mm -hmm. And when I look at my own Asian tradition, I use um, Asian terms. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's not just me. Many Asian American theologians are using mm -hmm. the terms like Han, H-A-N, mm -hmm. and also Chi, C-H-I, mm -hmm. to kind of give new words, help us kind of expand our theological mind mm -hmm. so that we can talk about God uh, yeah. as deeply, as creatively that we can as possible. How do you think that um, colonialism and uh, similar types of um, themes have shaped the way that Westerners do theology and relate to others? Okay. Well, I think uh, for a long time, those in power, which will be the West, mm -hmm. um, have colonized you know, the rest of the world in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. There's many forms of colonialism. Before, in the mm -hmm. past, it was colonizing the land. But now there's different forms mm -hmm. where you are colonizing resources and, and workers in, in a different format. Mm -hmm. And I think, in a way, um, theology has done the same thing where um, they are colonizing. Mm -hmm. So I think... Uh, with the rise of post-colonial literature, post-colonial scholars, mm. there is a movement of decolonization, mm. decolonization of people, decolonization of, of culture and minds, and also mm. of religion. That uh, we can't just have this center, the Eurocentric center kind of colonizing the all of mm. theology, saying that's the only way to do theology, that's the only way to understand God. Mm. So I think we need to have this openness. We need to kind of unpack the colonialism so that we can kind of move away from that. Yeah. Can you give me an example of a, a doctrine like a pneumatology, the theology of the spirit, for instance, um, that you've attempted to decolonize? And the reason I ask that question is because not everyone will be familiar necessarily with the phrase colonization or decolonization. And something of an example of how that might be done would be helpful. 
Okay, that's a huge question. Is, yeah, I <laughs> do answer big questions. These are all big questions. They're good <laughs> questions. So let me try to kind of answer the fact that, uh, you know, we have the Old Testament, we have Ruha, mm. and then the New Testament, we have Numa. I think when um, theology was centered in Europe, mm. uh, particularly with German mm. theologians, we use the word Geist. So those who hold the power are able to use their language and and language is very important. That's basically all we have when we're mm -hmm. doing theology or theological discourse, a language. So it really forms our thoughts, our minds. Mm -hmm. So when, when in Ruha, in the Old Testament, um, out of about 580 occurrences, mm -hmm. only a few, maybe 33 occurrences, are associated with God. In the New Testament, we see more of this uh, pneuma being associated with holy. And I think as Christians, once we put the word holy in front of any word, either holy church or holy Bible or holy spirit, it becomes a totally different thing in the sense that, you know, the spirit is how I see this Holy Spirit, it's a very global spirit. The Spirit of God moves in all cultures. Mm -hmm. If you go, and I know you're touring around the world, mm -hmm. when you visit different cultures and different people, they all have this understanding of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I bring in the Asian concept of Chi, this understanding of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So if all cultures have this understanding of the Spirit, and in the Old Testament where we find, you know, God says, I will be who I will be, mm -hmm. there's no way of us to kind of call colonize or say this is the only way to understand God. Mm -hmm. And so in pneumatology, once um, we added the word holy, it felt like only Christians had this monopoly mm -hmm. over what the spirit is or how we can articulate the spirit. And so in a sense, we've kind of colonized it. We've kind of made it our own and everyone else is false or wrong. I, you know, there is open for criticism here, but I think we really need to understand this spirit that can't be kind of put in a box, mm. the spirit that moves, and God touches all people mm. in different ways. God speaks to people in different ways. So I think uh, we have to kind of have this kind of global perspective of the mm. spirit where it, it is found in all cultures and religions. Mm. Where do you see resemblances or connections between Eastern understandings of Qi and Han and a Western Christian understanding of the spirit. So when you do the linguistics, um, when you do a linguistic analysis or when you're looking at the word and the mm. origin of the word, chi is very similar to the Hebrew understanding of ruha and the New Testament understanding of pneuma. Mm. So they're all basically words that um, capture the meaning of of energy, of life-giving, spirit, breath, um, of God, mm -hmm. so it, it kind of it's trying it's it embodies all of what Ruha and Numa mm -hmm. does. So when you see this similarity, you can't help but think perhaps Asians have been talking about this for a long time, mm -hmm. and then Christians keep saying you can't talk about that. We have the Holy Spirit. There is that clash. But I think for thousands of years, um, Asian mm -hmm. culture have talked about Chi and made it more accessible, where mm -hmm. it's part of their everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives a new perspective to the Holy Spirit when Jesus. Jesus left, Jesus said, I will send you the comfort of the mm. counselor, the mm. spirit. The spirit will be with you. But I think as Christians, unless you experience like the Pentecostal revival, we mm. think the spirit is not around or mm. is dead and we don't really experience the Holy mm. Spirit. But I think the accessibility that Asian culture, when we mm. talk about Qi and it's part of our everyday language, everyday lives, mm. that kind of reminds us, hey, the spirit is always with us, mm. whether we call it Holy Spirit mm. or Spirit or chi, whatever yeah. language that we have. So you see this opens up opportunities for interreligious conversations and understandings. Yes. And uh -huh. also maybe opportunities for describing more about what uh, theo Christian theology um, understands other areas as well. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I'm always interested in interfaith dialogue for many mm. reasons. I think here in the United mm. States where there is so much immigration and immigration mm. is happening in Australia and all, the, mm. all parts of the world, mm. we have to be able to uh, live with mm. one another. Mm. And different religions would clash and different cultures would clash, linguistics would clash. Mm. But I think if we are to live out God's commandment to mm. love one another, mm. it's not just to love those who are similar mm. to us yeah. or 
or look like us or mm. just believe what Christians believe. We are to love everybody. Mm. So I think it really opens up the door for interreligious mm. dialogue. When I first began uh, showing my interest in interreligious dialogue, I thought maybe the path of just talking about God or the doctrine of God or mm. our Christology might be helpful. And I found both of them very limiting. Mm. But I think spirit, because spirit is found in all these cultures and mm. religions, mm. and people are readily more open to talking about the mm. spirit, I think it's a great um, gateway or a door to talk about interfaith mm. dialogue so that we can really start understanding one another. We're always living in relationships, so mm. I think it's very important that we build relationships rather mm. than being afraid of one another or destroying mm. the relationships. In the grace of Sophia, you talk about the suffering, I think, of Korean-American women in patriarchal um, societies, uh, both Confucian and in Christian families. Um, I don't think it's unique to Korean American context, of course. How do you see patriarchy working in the church today? Uh, how is it expressed in ways that are damaging and destructive? Oh, I think it's expressed in so many ways. And it, it also depends which denomination mm. you're in. But even the progressive uh, denominations, it's expressed through a language where mm. um, the church is a little slower to adopt more inclusive language. Mm. Um, you know, we is God really some man, white man <laughs> with a beard <laughs> sitting in the, on a throne somewhere? <laughs> if God is spirit... You know, how can we put a gender to God? Yeah. So the language is still there. I think we also with, withhold uh, women's leadership in the church. Yeah. So we have, still have denominations that won't ordain women yeah. um, into the, uh, as teaching elder or as pastors. We, we don't do that. Yeah. So and, and, and then we have those denominations that do. But even in those denominations, there's always uh, patriarchy exists. And it's kind of so embedded that people just don't think it's still alive, but it really is, and it's a big struggle for many women in many, many ways. How do we start to to deal with some of that in the life of the church today? Um, well, as I said earlier, language is very important. Yeah. Um, language determines yeah. our thoughts and how we perceive the world. So I think one of the steps is using uh, inclusive language, um, yeah. being open to different languages, uh, understanding that, you know, God loved both men and women, created both men and women. Jesus had women leaders with him. You know, it was a woman who first went to visit the empty tomb. There are all these signs of how women have uh, been at the beginning of the church, the growth of the church. So we need to allow women leadership. And I think that will help both the men and the women in the church. Mm. You know, if we get rid of women's leadership right now, I don't know how it is in Australia, but in the United States, there's more women in the church, more women mm. membership than, mm. than men. So we can't deter the woman. <laughs> They're going to find some other ways to express spirituality or religion. Mm. So we have to embrace what women have to offer. and We have different gifts than mm. men. And hopefully that way we can start dismantling patriarchy. Mm. Within the church. Um, well, the church in the West is rapidly changing, just as Western cultures are, becoming much more multicultural. Um, how do Westerners and Western Christians racialize and minoritize immigrants today in ways that are unhelpful for the church? Yeah, well, so the problem is it's not just race, uh, patriarchy that we're fighting in the mm. church. We're also fighting racism. You know, we're racialized because racism is kind of systemically in our culture, in our mm -hmm. society. In, a, in the mm -hmm. United States, it's illegal. Racism mm -hmm. is illegal. But people still are racist and people are getting away with racism. Mm -hmm. So it's so embedded in our culture. You know, we had certain laws um, set in the United States that prevented uh, people of Asia to come in. So they mm -hmm. were these Chinese head tax laws. So those are now taken mm -hmm. away. So they're, you know, it's racism is illegal, but it's still embedded in our culture, mm -hmm. and it's also within our church. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult. People are always afraid of those who are not like them. You know, it's mm -hmm. no different from the biblical times where people were afraid of the foreigners. We have mm -hmm. the Ezra and Nehemiah passages mm -hmm. where, you know, mm -hmm. the foreign women are cast away, and in times of Jesus where people were afraid mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the Samaritans, mm -hmm. and, and so you know, this being afraid 
way kind of leads to racism and mm -hmm. I think you know Jesus came and Jesus embraced the Samaritan woman and mm -hmm. Jesus loved all people and I think we need to do likewise so I think the church has to fight patriarchy and racism. Mm -hmm. How do you think the concepts of hybridity and a hyphenated reality begin to solve some of these issues? Um, you know as uh, you know people don't call me American. I'm not American citizen, but I'm Canadian citizen. But even in Canada, I've never kind of thought of us Canadian. You're always Asian Canadian. So this kind of hyphenated reality where mm -hmm. you're not fully Canadian and then you're not fully Asian or Korean in my case. So we kind of live in this kind of in-between space. Mm -hmm. And that's what hybridity is talking about. This in-between space, this mixing of two realities mm -hmm. to make a new reality. I think the concept concept of hybridity and in-between space is a very liberative concept mm -hmm. within theology. I think when we even look at Jesus, he's a hybrid in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I think once we are able to bring in different concepts or cultures or theological understandings mm -hmm. from, from those who live in between spaces, mm -hmm. it really enriches how we understand God, how we can be engaged in theological mm -hmm. discourse. How do you think it might affect things in the life of the church like worship and prayer? Yeah. Um, so those practical things that happen on a Sunday in, Sunday out basis. Oh, I think it'll be, it'll probably mm -hmm. liven up the church. I think mm -hmm. if we can bring in African American traditions, mm -hmm. I mean, to the church, particularly um, churches that just want to just be a spectator mm -hmm. during worship, I think it will liven it up. I think we need to kind of use and blend and, and let hybridity kind of live out mm -hmm. in the church. There's so much interesting things from different cultures that we can use mm -hmm. to liven up worship, to help in our Bible studies. Even when we're studying the Bible, it's very important to have a Latin American perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, the story where um, the robber, uh, what's the story? The Good Samaritan, yeah. <laughs> the Good Samaritan <laughs> story. You know, Latin American people will look at that very differently, yeah. and they are the ones that are victimized. Mm -hmm. While as in North America, we try to figure out are we the first passerby, the second one, or the third while we try to do that. Yeah. But in places from the South, they look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. So I think the hybridity needs to come into play. I think when we can read the Bible or worship God mm -hmm. uh, from multiple perspectives and multiple cultures, it just helps us to become better people. Mm -hmm. It helps us to welcome those who are different, helps mm. us to live out the gospel message. Mm. You've written a bit about spirituality as well and cultivating spirituality that helps to address some of the isms that we've addressed as well as things like global warming and so forth. Do you have any thoughts about the qualities or characteristics of a spirituality that is up to such a big task today? Yeah, um, you know, there are so many instances and um, I'm glad yeah. that you also brought in um, the climate change that's yes. happening. Yeah. I think, um, you know, spiritual, the, why I'm always driven to pneumatology or the understanding of the spirit is because it's kind of, it crosses over to different cultures, mm -hmm. it crosses over into different religions, and when we're going to fight these isms, whether it be classism, sexism, patriarchy, or what we're doing with the earth, with global mm -hmm. warming and climate change, it can't just be, oh, let us little Christians just handle this problem. Mm -hmm. This is a global problem. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy is a global problem. Uh, racism is not just here, it's on all over the play, all mm -hmm. over the world. So and this climate justice that we really need to work on, it's it's a it's a global mm -hmm. problem that we're mm -hmm. working on. So we in that perspective, we need everybody, every mm -hmm. person on this earth to kind of come together and and decide that we are going to work and fight this. Mm -hmm. So we need people of all faith and all spiritual uh, upbringing that we need to kind of come mm -hmm. together to fight it. Mm -hmm. It just can't be. And, 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 you know, Christians aren't doing the best thing either, mm -hmm. especially with global warming. We're not mm -hmm. the best <laughs> at yeah. this. Other religions are doing a little bit better. So I think we need to learn together and, and, and join mm -hmm. forces to help. We, um, sometimes we don't connect the relationship between something like environmental destruction or global warming with racism and sexism, um, but you say they are connected. 
Mm-hmm. I think it's connected. Um, when we look at global mm-hmm. warming, you know, it's the rich white mm-hmm. countries right now that are producing a lot of mm-hmm. uh, the damage to the earth. And we are able to do this and get away with it in many cases. Mm-hmm. And in that way, it's the poor, um, the mm-hmm. racialized uh, ethnic people mm-hmm. in the global south and in Asia that are suffering. So there is this environmental racism that's happening mm-hmm. that we need to be aware of. So I think, you know, there's a lot that the church needs to be engaged mm-hmm. in, and I hope that we can kind of work mm-hmm. together. But this. You know, we only have one planet to live on at this point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we keep talking about Earth as a Mother Earth. And in that way, in one way it's good, and another way is we always have dominated women. We have mm-hmm. um, either molested women or, or raped women. Yeah. And because we feminize the Earth, we do the same thing. We rape the Earth, we take whatever we want from the Earth for our enjoyment, and the Earth is dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think we have to be careful of how we do these imagery, how we understand. And if God created the world, we are to be good stewards and take mm-hmm. care of the world. Mm-hmm. And I think that's number one priority. You know, we just celebrated Earth Day on April 22nd this year. And I think we have to keep in mind that this is a big fight and we all have to do it together. Mm. Now, there's been a lot written and spoken about the mission of the church today. Uh, there's a missional church conversation and so on in the West. What do you think is the mission of the church and how do we pursue that mission? Wow, that's a big question too. <laughs> I don't know. If I there's... always ask these grand questions. <laughs> yeah, you do. They're very good questions, yeah. I must say. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's because I know you know in seminaries people talk about the missional church. I don't know if the church has one mission or the mission. I mm. think there may be multiple missions, but I think of something very important. I think this day and age mm. that will tackle the patriarchy and the sexism mm. and the racism is. I think the mission of the church is to love. I think when Jesus came, he showed us how we are to love one another. He was with the poor. He was with the marginalized. He was with the woman. He was with the leper. And these are all people that the dominant people are afraid of. There's something, there's a stigma. and But Jesus kind of showed that that's how you build the reign of God here on earth. And I think that should be one of the priority that how are we to love? And I think if we can really love those who are different from us, I think as human beings, we're all relational people. We can't live by ourselves. We're not on an island by ourselves as relational people how mm. are we going to love and mm. I think that has to be a great mission mm. and once we know how to love that will break down the patriarchy and the mm. racism and the climate change that's happening because we will take care of one mm. another and the earth mm. you know God's creation is not just human beings it's everything the animals mm. and the earth so mm. I think it's how do we love mm. now what do you think is most misunderstood about your proposals and your writings? Oh, um, I don't know about the most misunderstood. I think people um, get a little afraid when you throw in the word hybridity or Mm. syncretism. You know, the church, even when we look at the Hebrew literature, there's a lot of syncretism already happening. Mm. Hybridity was occurring. Uh, Even with the white uh, European Uh, Christian theology, you know, paganism was involved, all this hybridity, all this Mm. mixing have been occurring, but Mm. nobody really challenges it until Mm. maybe an Asian American woman or an African American woman, someone else from the outside challenges, then it becomes, oh no, we never did it. So I think that might be one of the criticisms, people get afraid that I'm introducing something new when mm. it's not really new. It's mm. it's what the church has been, and mm. uh, we just need to hear it and label it and move forward how we are going to engage in this world mm. in a loving way. Mm. Do you have anything else you want to say to us today? Um, I think you know if if I think if we can love. I think that will solve so many of the problems. Mm-hmm. Love the way that God has shown us. Mm. You know, we ridicule people all the time. We ridicule those. Um, you know, uh, different sexuality, different race, ethnicity, different class. And when we think about Jesus' own life, he was ridiculed in many ways. They were saying, you know, how can anything good come from Nazareth? Oh, he was born of Mary and Joseph. And when he was on the cross, people, you know, they put the crown of thorns, put the robe, and they were laughing at him. People were mocking him. 
But I think we have to sit back and we can't ridicule people. I think we have to embrace those who are different. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, you know, my new book coming out is Embracing the Other. And I think that is an important task for us. Mm. So thank you for your important work. I think this is a wonderful project and I hope uh, it will reach out to many that people will begin to yeah, love and those who have been more power to mm -hmm. them. Thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.